so what what we're going to talk about tonight is something that that really gets my ire up because trying to have the right government in Michigan means trying to have Michigan be competitive, have it uh, have a good economy. We want people to stay in the state. We want businesses to be attracted and be retained. And that's basically what it's all about, you know. And we like we like the Republican Party because they tend to be more that way. But there's a, an organization that is uh, really great nationwide that we've worked with before. It's uh, Americans for Prosperity, it's the, which was started by the Koch brothers. And they're a conservative group and they're really doing what we do here in, at NORC. They're trying to educate people, they're trying to uh, under, have people be aware of what's going on at local levels, at the grassroots level. But we're very fortunate to partner once again with Americans for Prosperity. And I'd like to introduce the, uh, the state director, Annie Pot Patnoid. I assume I pronounced that close, closely enough. And, uh, and she's going to introduce our speakers going forward. Thank you, Annie. I think Matt is a little taller than I am, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, well, thank you for, let me, is that better? Yes, that's better. Um, thank you for having us today, for coming, for listening uh, to what we have to say, because Michigan is really at, I think, a crisis point right now with some of the policies that have been rammed through by Governor Whitmer. And make no mistake, she is the one who is really putting her caucus out there on these issues. So she's really the one who's driving the agenda in Lansing, driving the agenda with the press, and she wants to drive her agenda all the way up to the national level. And that is why I believe uh, the Democrats repealed a very successful piece of legislation that gives workers the freedom to choose whether to join a union. It does not eliminate collective bargaining or any of those things. It simply gives people the right to choose to join a union instead of forcing them to join one. But we're going to hear a lot more about that. In 2012, I was relatively new to Michigan. I had moved here with my family in 2011. I moved from the lowest unemployment rate in the entire country, which was right outside of Washington, D.C. Shocking, I know. And I moved to the highest unemployment rate in the entire country. And that was Michigan in 2011. And I remember looking at my husband saying, what are we doing? Is this a bad move? Well, since then, we've had six kids, so we're contributing to <laughs> Michigan's population growth. <laughs> and I'm doing the work here that I love, which is seeking to make a difference in our state so that my kids, who are all native Michiganders, can grow up and feel like there is opportunity here, opportunity to achieve the American dream, to have prosperity. And that is what is under attack right now. And that is why we need to get active. And we need to make sure our action is focused in the right areas. And frankly, in the areas where we can reach swing voters. Who in here is a swing voter? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who in here votes in primaries on the Republican side? So we have to learn not to just talk to ourselves, but we have to learn how to talk to them. And issues like right to work, cutting taxes, reducing spending, exposing wasteful spending are great issues where we can help build bridges. AFP did some polling, right? Uh, it was maybe a little over the height of the COVID lockdowns here in Michigan. And one thing we asked voters to do is to give the governor a letter grade on her COVID response. How many people gave the governor an F? Do you want to guess? Oh. You in the back, drinking your beer. All of them. All of them? Okay, wrong answer. How about another guess? 10%. 
10%, wrong. 15%, getting closer. 54%. I kind of want to say at least 50% give or Twenty About 25%. Yeah. Oh. What was the makeup? What was the political makeup of the people there? Statewide poll. Everybody. No, some people gave her a D. That, I think, was about another 15%. So who, who here would give Governor Whitmer an F? Yeah, exactly. We have to talk to those people who gave her a B or a C. And you have to acknowledge you're not that person. I know I'm not. I would give her an F if I was asked in that poll. So we have to learn how to talk to people. And right to work, the polling shows is actually a great issue to talk about, especially when we're staring in the face, skyrocketing inflation that they're barely controlling by raising interest rates and threatening a banking collapse, pursuit of ESG uh, investments, right? These are good issues to talk with regular voters who gave her a C or maybe a B. We're never going to get to the A's, let's be honest. <laughs> But those C's and B's, we can make, we can get to them. And right to work is a great issue to get to them. The polling shows that about 60% of voters, when they're polled on this issue, say yes. Workers should have the freedom to choose whether to join a union. Unfortunately, they repealed right to work. But what you're going to hear tonight is how they want to take that agenda even further in our state. That's why even though they've taken this vote, we need to make them feel it. We need to make them feel the pain. And we can do that by getting active, by writing letters to the editor, by knocking on doors and just talking to people about our issues. Not talking about candidates. Who's frustrated with the candidates, right? Options. Like a lot of people, a lot of voters are. Talking about the issues. People at the door are ready to hear our message. If you can't do that, you can write a letter to the editor, or you can agree to put your name on a letter to the editor, or you can call your lawmaker, or you can show up for a day at the Capitol. I've got my team here tonight. If you would all stand, I'm going to embarrass you a little. Caitlin Viar, Ty Bundy, and Tim Golding, who heads up my grassroots operation. When we're all done talking here tonight, go out and do something. You don't have to do it with our organization, but I would love for you to talk to my team and figure out how you can fit in. How can you slot in? How can you help us move the needle? Because the people in this room are not enough. We need to bring more people in, and we need to learn to message to those C's and D's more effectively. That doesn't mean compromising our beliefs. That doesn't mean backing down. It means using messages that will resonate and will be effective with those voters that we know we have to get. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Terry Bowman is a worker at Ford. He has worked on the line for 35 years. In 2012, Terry and I were involved in the passage of Right to Work, and Terry was directly, personally impacted by that change because it gave him the choice to opt out of his union. Terry, along with tens of thousands of workers across this state, will now be forced back into a union whose political beliefs they don't agree with and they may not agree that their union is representing them well. And some workers may simply not have the money, especially with inflation, to afford their union dues. It's really wrong, and I think Terry can best speak to not just the political implications, the policy implications, but what it means personally for these workers who are going to be stripped of their freedom and stripped of their choice. And all of us in Michigan suffer when that happens. So with that, I'd like to bring up Terry to talk. 
Well, first of all, thank you, Annie. Um, I, I actually, I've worked for Ford for just 26 and a half years. So um, that's okay. I just, uh, I'm not that old. Um, although, uh, trust me, with the aches in the shoulders and, and uh, arms and knees, it sometimes feels like I've been there 35 years. Well, listen, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I think 12 years ago, I was here at a NORC meeting talking about right to work. So it's funny, isn't it, how it's all come full circle. Um, it's just amazing. I, I was here doing a, a tour and doing the tour with Americans for Prosperity, who I think uh, has shown us over the last uh, 15 years or so that they are without a doubt the number one grassroots organization in Michigan. So uh, thank you, Annie, and thanks uh, everybody, uh, all you guys for all the work you're doing at Americans for Prosperity. I, we know that all the citizens of Michigan appreciate it, and uh, especially all of us forced unionism workers are gonna appreciate all the work that you do as well. Um, so what I'm up here for to tell you is uh, a few things about uh, what right to work means to me uh, and to union members around the state of Michigan, what the repeal means to me, and uh, what, what we're going to see because of that. Um, and I think there's three things that are important to keep in mind. Um, first of all, right to work. What is it and what isn't it? Uh, Annie uh, briefly brushed on this. You know, with the union rhetoric that came out um, during the right to work battle back in 2010 through 2012, uh, unions uh, officials were always saying that it was going to weaken unions, that it was going to take away their ability to collectively bargain, that it was going to cause a divisive workplace. We argued against that very effectively and said none of that is true. We knew what happens in states that passes a right to work uh, law and none of that was the case. And I'm here to tell you after we passed right to work, unions remained strong, they were still ab able to collectively bargain, they were still able to go out and organize new uh, places of uh, business uh, and it did not cause a divisive workplace. I work with the same people I worked with for the last 26 and a half years years, many of them still paying their dues, some of them not paying the dues, uh, and we work side by side with no issues whatsoever. So right to work never did cause the issues uh, that they said it was going to do. So the question is, why then would they want to repeal it? After all, what it really did do was grant to individual union workers in the state of Michigan additional rights freedoms and protections that they didn't have before. The, the ability to hold their union officials answerable and accountable to the kind of job that they did. Because after all, without a right to work law, we know that a union official can put their legs up on the desk and laugh all the way to the bank because they know that workers are required by law or um, by threat of being fired of paying them dues money whether they do a good job or a bad job. What right to work was it empowered individual workers to hold their union officials answerable and accountable. And this is a, an issue that for all of us that have siblings or friends, family members that are union members, we can talk to them simply about that. When I would talk to union members about what right to work means for them, they would say, you know, I've never looked at it that way. All I've heard is the rhetoric that comes from my union officials saying how bad it is for unions. It's actually not anti-union at all. It's pro-union worker. So why did they repeal it? They're repealing and taking away rights from individual workers. Well, it's pretty clear why they're repealing it, isn't it? It's not the individual workers who have control of the union coffers and the union purse strings. It's the union officials that don't want to be held answerable and accountable from the regular rank and file. So uh, the first thing we need to remember is this repeal is taking away rights, freedoms, and protections from individual union workers and giving that power back to union officials. Why that's bad? I'm a UAW worker. Um, I'm represented by the UAW. They're just coming off a seven to eight year federal corruption trial uh, that without right to work in place, it led to a culture of corruption because they knew they could do whatever they wanted and workers were forced to financially support them. So 
Um, that's the first thing to think about. Secondly, the Michigan's right to work law now only covers workers in the private sector. And what I mean by that is back in 2018, there was a Supreme Court case called Janus versus Ask Me. And the Supreme Court uh, justices found in favor of Mark Janus, who is a worker, uh, and said, because of this ruling, all public sector workers in the United States now have right to work. So Michigan's right to work law can't overcome a U.S. Supreme Court decision. So all public sector workers in the state of Michigan and around the United States are guaranteed their right to work by the Janus decision in 2018. So now this right to work law in Michigan only covered workers like me in the private sector. So it, to me, it begs this question. Uh, and I have to ask those um, legislators who want to take away my rights, my freedoms, and my protections. Because I'm in the private sector, do I somehow matter less? Do I have less rights available to me? Am I somehow less of a person? No, and of course the answer is no. I should deserve those same rights, those same freedoms and protections that public sector workers enjoy all the way around. Just because I'm a private sector worker does not mean I should not have those, those same rights that public sector workers do too. And that is another great um, uh, fact of this that you can share with uh, your friends, family members, um, and legislators that you might bump into. Why don't private sector workers deserve the same rights, the same freedoms and protections that public sector uh, workers receive through the Supreme Court? And then lastly, the last thing I want to talk about is the fact, this is, this is an issue, this right to work issue, and, and Annie touched on this. This is an issue that has got very strong support, not only from the voters in the state of Michigan, but from union households. We have polling uh, that shows that members in union households in a two to one margin agree with the statement that workers should be able to choose for themselves whether or not they want to financially support and join a union in the state of Michigan. So it's also in union households that this is a big issue for. So again, uh, as I said at the beginning, who are they really repealing this for? It's not workers. It's for the people who hold the purse strings and the union coffers. Never run away from right to work. It is, we still have the moral high ground on this issue. No person should be forced by an outside third party agency to support them as a condition of employment, especially when that third party agency is so involved in political and social issues that many workers disagree with. For me, that was the biggest issue. The whole biggest issue that I decided to, uh, 12 years ago and it, with the passage 10 years ago, why I decided to put my face as the face of right to work in Michigan. Because I could not stand the fact that my union was supporting political and social issues that I disagreed with. And I said, somebody has to do something about this. When they repeal right to work, they say tough. You want to keep your job, you have to pay us money. There's no ifs, ands, buts, or buts. It. So we have the moral high ground on the issue. We have the economic high ground on this issue as well. We know uh, without a doubt that businesses prefer states to relocate to that are right to work states. I, I know the other side doesn't like this fact, but they can't deny that it's true. And for me, it ends. Uh, and uh, once I read a magazine called Chief Executive Magazine, where business leaders uh, said, quite frankly, um, we would rather much locate in a right to work state. It's just that simple. It's, it's for our economic freedom. It, we have the economic high ground, we have the moral high ground, and we have the freedom high ground. Again, no worker should be shackled to an outside third party and pay them money as a condition of employment for just pursuing their American dream by getting a, a job and earning money for their family. So when you talk to your family members, be proud of the fact that, uh, that you are right to work, that you agree with right to work, that you say, um, I am right to work because I believe in union workers. 
It's pro-worker, it is not anti-union. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Annie or am I turning it over to Vinny? You wanna introduce Vinny? Okay, well, sure. um, so when we were traveling the state fighting for right to work, um, uh, Vinnie Vernuccio at the time was the director of labor policy at the Mackinac Center here in Michigan. Um, Vinnie uh, is still involved with the Mackinac Center here in Michigan, but he's also a, the president of an organization near and dear to my heart since I'm on the board. Uh, it's called the Institute for the American Worker, and uh, you can go to the website i4aw.org and see all the great work that Vinnie's doing through the Institute for the American Worker. And uh, we invited him back here in Michigan uh, uh, once again, we got the team back together uh, to fight back against everything that's going on in Lansing. And uh, he's here to talk about not only the right to work, but also all the other lists of bad menu ideas that Democrats are throwing forward um, on this labor policy issue. So, Vinny, can you come on up? Sure. Well, thanks, Terry, thanks, Mike, uh, NROC, NARC, thank you for having me. I think I was here uh, when we were chatting about this in 2012. Um, Annie, thanks for inviting me out, and um, uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, so, Vinny Verduccio, uh, yeah, uh, here, Senior Fellow with the Mackinac Center, and uh, just want to give you a little bit of my background. So, um, I came out to Michigan for the first time to go to law school during the lost decade, when Employment was terrible. There were no jobs. Property values were plummeting. Um, then I went to DC. I came back in 2012, like Terry said, and we got right to work. And then for the next couple years, property values were skyrocketing. Wages were going up. Our unemployment plummeted. Our jobs were plentiful. And I stayed, and uh, for me, unfortunately, I mean, it was good for my family and career, but I went down to DC in 2019. Now I'm back. What did you guys do? <laughs> I mean, things were great in 2019. We, got, we lost right to work. Um, you know, jobs are gonna probably not be nearly as good as they were. And you know, now that we have right now, without right to work, guys like Terry are gonna be forced to pay union dues. And by the way, do you know what, you know what right to work, let's just talk about the definition of right to work. They say, right to work means you cannot be forced to pay a union as a condition of employment. That's kind of a mouthful. You know what I like to say? Right to work means that a union can't get a worker fired for not paying them. That's it. That's all it does. It means that the UAW can't go to Terry and say, Terry, you gotta pay us, or we're gonna go to Ford and tell them they have to fire you. That's all right to work means. Doesn't affect collective bargaining in any other way. Workers and unions can still negotiate over wages, hours, working conditions, anything before right to work they can negotiate for after right to work, except for the ability to say, pay us or you're fired. Um, other states after Michigan went right to work um, and have passed good things. And I could talk a little bit about that. I don't know if we're gonna get to do Q and A. But um, unfortunately, there is a very bad suite of bills that even though we lost right to work, there's some that actually scare me even more than the repeal of right to work, and we'll get there. Uh, let's talk about some of them. Uh, first, uh, there's bills to make schools the fundraiser for union dues again. Um, right before right to work, uh, teachers union dues, uh, the school said, the legislature told schools, well, you know, if you, teachers unions want to collect dues, get a credit card or bank account information, just like you charge your gym membership, your cell phone bill. Teachers unions in Michigan have been doing that for over a decade. They want to say, no, let's let the taxpayers be the bill collector for those dues again. Um, they also want to give unions special privileges when it comes to politics and in-kind contributions. wonder why they want to do that. Uh, well, I, I heard somebody just say money. Here's the one, and I'll, I'll jump. I was going to save this for the end, but Annie, because you asked. Um, here's the one that scares me the most. There is a bill proposed that would give a tax credit for union dues. Now, 
I don't want y'all to confuse that with a tax deduction. A tax deduction is money that you spend on something, the amount you would have paid on taxes, you can reduce, and there's above the line, below the line, let's get not, let's don't get that technical. What there's a bill in Lansing right now to do is a tax credit, meaning every cent that a public employee pays at union dues, they get back. Let's say you have a teacher's union, dues are, uh, you know, it, it, it varies anywhere between $600 to $1,000. Let's use 1000 to be a nice round number. You pay $1,000 in union dues, the Michigan taxpayer will give you $1,000 back. If you owe $700 in tax liability to the state, they'll wipe that out and send you a check for 300 bucks. Gets worse. Other states are looking at doing this now. They're subject to appropriations, there's caps. Not good ideas, not by a log shot, but at least there's some sort of boundary. The bill in Lansing right now, there's nothing. It simply says you will get a credit, and if that credit is more than your liability, you will get a check. Conceivably, a government union could raise dues to $20,000 a year. And guess what? The taxpayer, you guys, are the ones that are going to have to pay it. How can you fight it? Uh, well, that's where I think Andy's going to talk about how you guys get more active. But that's the one that scares me because now you can see union special interest. Just let's raise dues, we'll have taxpayers pay for it, and they can get entrenched for a generation. That's the one that really scares me. Um, you know, there's a couple others that we just want to be aware of. Uh, project labor agreements, PLAs, anybody familiar with that? Seeing a couple, one or two hands. Okay, who's seen The Godfather? <laughs> okay, you remember the scene where God, Don, the, the Don's consigliere goes to Hollywood and he's meeting with the Hollywood big shot and he goes, you know, you're gonna get some, uh, you may have some union problems coming up. I can make that all go away, just give me what I want. That's a PLA. It's a pre-hire agreement to say the unions will not cause trouble if we give them what they want. Um, th those have been banned in Michigan um, for a long time now, and um, now there's bills to try to allow those to happen again, both at the state and the local level. And th the last one I, I wanna talk about is a thing called employer meetings on unionization. I call them emus. They're essentially an employer, when a union's trying to organize them, can talk to their employees during work time. The employees are getting paid, so let's, you know, you know, I don't want anybody to get worried there. And say, well, that may not work for us. You know, it may not work for our culture or company. Basically, it's the employer being able to have free speech, meet and talk with their employees about what unionization will do. Pretty innocuous, right? Um, in fact, uh, you know, we, we, we've talked to some people about it, and even some union supporters say, yeah, I, I, I'm getting paid, I can just sleep through the meeting. Not a big deal. Well, at the National NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, um, and in several states, unfortunately, another bill right here in Michigan, they are trying to ban those. They're trying to call them captive audience meetings. Ooh, scary, right? Captive audience meetings. They're <laughs> employer meetings. They're meetings where, just like you have to sit through HR meetings or presentations on, well, you know, let's even use what the left's like, you know, um, DEI. DEI or uh, harass, anti harassment trading, equity trading. Safety Safety meetings, same thing. It's an all staff meeting where you simply just listen to what your employer is saying and you're getting paid. They want to ban these and harm employers first amendment rights. There's just a suite of these bills. I know Andy is gonna talk a little bit more about it, but um, you know, I think there's still hope in Michigan. I'm seeing a lot of really good things from other states. I work with Mackinac. We're doing a lot of work in states like Tennessee and Oklahoma and Florida and Governor DeSantis. Um, it has some, you know, fantastic legislation down there. Happy to talk about that if we have time. But um, it's great to be with you all. 
there still is hope. I know things are a little dark. It feels like the wilderness, and I don't really like that. It's cold out there, isn't it? <laughs> but I know we're going to be able to come back working with Americans for Prosperity, working with N um, NORC. You guys can get active. You guys can help. And um, there still is a bright future here. Let's just get out of the wilderness for a little bit. OK? Thank you very much. Need the mic, but are there any questions? If you there are, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. We're we'll, we'll do uh, questions a special way here at NARC. Um, I'm turning on the uh, microphone to the camera over there. So. Um, if you, if anybody has questions, come over here, and uh, we want to make sure that the Q and A is captured for our uh, YouTube channel. So let's keep it to 30 seconds. Okay. Sam Harris, Waterford uh, delegate. So the PLA uh, agreements you said are outlawed. Uh, didn't uh, Detroit Public Schools have the DPS PLA in place for quite a while? And Macomb County? That's my question, PLAs. Um, I'm not sure. I know with the Fair and Open Competition Act that they, in Lansing, they did make it illegal a number of years ago. Okay. Anyone else? All right. How about the trade executive order? Isn't that illegal? What is the uh, what show? trade executive order is? Did you have? No. When they have, uh, they have uh, funds from the city, and you have to have a quota of Detroit city res residents so and minorities. Do you want to address that? Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I know there are. Uh, Vinny. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I have not followed the litigation on that, so unfortunately, I'm not sure. I do know that um, both here and probably here again in Michigan, with a lot of the things they're trying to do in Lansing and in other states, they do try to um, put sorts of mandates on there. Um, I believe San Francisco has some, but let me tell you about a good mandate tying to state or federal dollars. Unfortunately, it's not here in Michigan. But um, the Speaker of the House in Tennessee has introduced a bill um, requiring the secret ballot for unionization elections for companies that are getting economic development incentives. Um, so are you all familiar with car check? Yep. Okay, so uh, are we running out of time? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, take all. So, uh, so, so car check is when they're, you know, they're trying to organize an employer. Unions are trying to organize an employer. They'll go around with a petition or or cards, and um, they'll say here, you know, so, you know, ideally it's here. Sign up for the union, and if you want us to represent you, sign this card. That's not what happens. Generally, what happens is they sign these cards. And the cards can, in you know, big font, say, sign up for the, to come to our pizza party, or sign up for this raffle. And then in a little six-point font on the bottom, it says, yeah, hereby authorize the union to represent me. Or it's worse. There's actually NLRB cases where, as they said, an overzealous employee goes around with a card and says, you know, if you don't sign this, what do you think the union's going to do to your car? or to your children, you should sign this. And then an employer has the option to say, I see you got 50%, I'll recognize you, or no, let's protect the secret ballot for employees. So just going back to your question, as a good example, what we're seeing in Tennessee, and this bill has already passed the House in Tennessee, it's uh, uh, hopefully going to pass the Senate as well, is they're saying that, no, you can't do card check. We want to protect the privacy of workers and their right to a private vote. And they're tying that to taxpayer dollars. So that's just going back to the question, an example of how things can be beneficial or proactive. But unfortunately, cities and states, they do have a lot of leeway when it does come to their own spending. So sorry, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I am not as up to speed on the Detroit executive order.
So as I said, Michigan's at a crisis. You all agree? Yeah. Get active, get involved, get focused. Talk to my team. If you guys want to get active on other things, we want to train you to do that. We want to arm you. We want to equip you. Because somebody asked in this room, what can we do? Elections have consequences. The election next year starts this year. And it starts with talking with people about issues. Then, next year, we'll be more ready to talk with them about candidates who are going to advance those issues. So get involved. Don't just sit there. Don't just listen. Get yourself educated. Everybody can do something. We had a lady in one of our chapters, and she didn't knock doors, and she didn't make phone calls, but she could bake cookies. And she baked cookies for the people who did do doors and did make phone calls. And that's how she got involved, and that's how she got active. I'll conclude my speech with a shocking admission. I'd rather not be here tonight. I have six kids. My oldest is almost 13 and my youngest is three and a half. In all candor, I'd rather be at home with them. But the work that I am doing is so important for their futures that I am here tonight. And it's important for them that I'm involved. Because if we don't speak up, who will? So thank you, Matt. Wait, we okay. have one. Thank you. We got, a, <laughs> yes. we got a question. Question. We got one question. Um, could you define public employees? Um, you know, school teachers, obviously. Police, count, fire. Police. What yeah. about if a company is subsidized by the federal government or a government agency? You can't consider that a... You know, that would be an interesting potential lawsuit. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has tried that, well, but no. I used to play one on no. TV, so no. <laughs> no, but I, to me, that makes sense. If they're being subsidized in any way, shape, or form by the government, they're basically public employees. My taxes are going to them. So if you could look into that and make me a hero, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the legality of that. But I'll tell you, in the state of Michigan, we've been doing a lot of that, giving tax dollars to companies. Um, we've uh, now forked over almost $1.6 billion to Ford. But I'll tell you the dirty secret is in the news release, it is going to Ford, but then there's a international... A companion to the project. So what they really mean is there's a foreign-owned company as well. So we are not only giving tax dollars to um, rich and powerful and well-connected American companies, which frankly is bad enough, but we're also giving it to companies from overseas. It's all wrong, it's all bad, but it's a great question. You know, are, are these companies, quasi-governmental entities. I will tell you, I don't know that the law will agree with, with us on that, but I think that the point is a really good one, and it's something that we need to make sure that we're educating friends and neighbors on. So thank you, Matt, so much for having thank us and, so and uh, hosting us, yeah. and I hope this was informative. I hope this arms you with information, and talk to my team about how you can get involved. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much. And even though it looks like right to work is going to be, the repeal of it is going to be signed into law probably next week or whenever, the gov it's already going to the governor's desk. This is something that we need to use to educate the people of Michigan for next year's election and then in 26 for the next gubernatorial election. And I'd like to share some of my personal experiences with the unions. I unfortunately have had three specific ones I want to mention. When I was First out of college, I went to work for a truck body factory in uh, Chesterfield Township. And this particular company was making truck bodies that Chrysler would bring in the chassis we'd put the body on. We were building bodies for not only Chrysler for the uh, carry van, we were building ambulance for the military, we were building post office trucks. And the union that was in there was AFL-CIO. 
And they were actually, the rate there was less than the UAW rate. And that's basically why Chrysler was having us build those bodies and, the, and we got all those other contracts. Well, contract negotiations and the uh, union went on strike. And this was Mark Body. They, uh, and they were on strike for a long time. And um, our customers told us, all of them said, look, it, either you go back to work or we're going to pull our contracts and go down south to a to right to work to the non-union plants. And we told the union this. And they basically weren't interested. And so sure enough, after a period of time, we lost all the contracts. Then the union came back and said, well, we want to talk about that. And we said, no, there's no more work. There's, just stay out there. And then the, uh, the corporate, the corporation that owned Mark Body pulled the plug and Mark Body went bankrupt. All those contracts went down south to right to work uh, companies down there. Years later, I was vice president of international sales for a, a fairly large company, which is now part of SPX Corporation. And I was doing trade shows. In, in, I was exhibiting our industrial products in some of these uh, huge industrial shows around the world. Like the Hanover Fair in Germany, which is arguably the largest trade fair in the world. And there you would see many states, including Michigan, that would have a booth. And they were trying to attract these companies, these big automakers and all that around, and different companies to come to their states to build their factories there. These are for the companies that wanted to come to the United States and come to our state. But you would see in some of these states big banners that said, right to work state. And this was such a significant thing. And this is things that these companies were looking for, like Terry was talking about that. And sure enough, South Carolina was able to attract uh, BMW, and they're building BMWs in South Carolina, and they're, they're the uh, BMW SUV, they're shipping them all over the world from South Carolina. And being a right-to-work state was what made all that difference in the world. And then my, the last uh, anecdote I want to share with you is uh, years after that, I was involved in an investment group which bought a window and door company in Canada. And uh, this window and door company was manufacturing windows for homes and doors, and then also had about 25 different installation crews, and we would install them. One of the few companies out there that did both manufacturing and installation. And unbelievably, the UAW targeted that company. And this was right after I had read that uh, the head of the UAW at, at their annual meeting said, we are going to go after non-automotive companies. We need to diversify. And sure enough, they came after uh, Ducana Windows and Doors in Canada. And, and sure enough, they did that thing where they uh, ran the uh, petition get to force the vote. After they had, were hanging out at our gate for day after day for weeks and making all sorts of unreal promises. And the thing is, we were advised by our lawyers that they can make those promises, but we can't really tell them anything that would tell them that those promises are unrealistic because we're, our hands were tied. Anything we said that was considered that would be anti-union would automatically certify the union. And I knew it was a problem on the day of the vote when the, the uh, union people knew our workers on a first name basis. They had been whining them and dining them and uh, they knew their family, knew everything about them. They were probably giving them gifts. And sure enough, unfortunately, Ducana became a, a UAW company. And, and I don't want to get into too many details what that was like, but when the, uh, and let me just say this, they were the only window and door company in Ontario that was that had a union in it. And it put us at a great uh, financial disadvantage with our wages and stuff. And sure enough, when the Great Recession came, 2008, the companies in order to survive were, you know, the window and door companies, companies in that business, were consolidating. They were, they were merging together. And I was working very hard trying to find companies to merge with or equity firms to merge with. And they liked the company. And then they would realize oh, you got a union in there, forget it. And we were like toxic because we had a union. They saw it like a cancer and they didn't want to bring that into their companies. And um, unfortunately, uh, Ducana didn't survive and it went bankrupt shortly after that. 
And so that's my experience with unions. And this is why companies that are looking to come to the United States will look for non-union companies. We'll look for right-to-work states where it's not forced. And that's why I wanted to make this an issue tonight because it is so important for the future of Michigan's economy to be right to work. If we want to attract businesses from overseas, we shouldn't have to pay billions of dollars out of our funds as to try to deprive companies to come. We should create a type of environment that attracts businesses that they know they can do well here. And, and look at what's happening. We got even our own, like Ford, is, is investing in, uh, in, in other states to build facilities, battery plants, and stuff like that. And a uh, and company like Tesla, you'd think they'd want to come to where the Motor City is, but no, they're not going to come anywhere near this uh, union state.